when you're in positions of, of privileged access, like a, a systems administrator for these sort of intelligence community agencies, and because of that, you see things that uh, may be disturbing. For decades, humanity has been captivated by the allure of our celestial neighbor, the moon. We've walked upon its dusty surface, planted our flag, and dreamed of returning. But have you ever asked yourself why, in the age of smartphones and self-driving cars, haven't we gone back? Why does the moon, once a symbol of human achievement, remain untouched by human feet for over half a century? Could it be that there's more to the story than we've been told? Is there something beyond the official narrative that's been hidden from the world? Join us in this groundbreaking expose as Edward Snowden unveils the stunning reasons why we have not gone back to the moon for over half a century. According to Snowden, one big reason NASA hasn't gone back to the moon is the huge amount of money it takes. It's like trying to buy a ticket to outer space, super expensive. Back when President Kennedy was in charge, he thought it would cost about $7 billion, but in the end, it ended up being more than $20 billion. That's a lot of cash. The Apollo project, which was all about going to the moon, cost a whopping $25.8 billion. In today's money, that's like $264 billion. That's more money than most of us can even picture. And get this, over 400,000 people, along with help from more than 20,000 companies and schools, had to work together to make it happen. So you can see why the cost was sky high. Then there was President Nixon. He had some serious doubts about going back to the moon. He thought it was too dangerous and way too expensive. He believed that only if there was a competition or some way to make money out of it, it would make sense to go back. So he was not a big fan of the moon missions. Now, let's fast forward to the 1980s. President Ronald Reagan had this big idea for a space station called Space Station Freedom. At first, it was supposed to cost around $8 billion, but by 2010, it had ballooned to over $100 billion. That's like your allowance going from $8 to $100 in just a few years. NASA wanted it to be more efficient, but the costs just kept going up and up. Here's where it gets interesting. The space industry wanted a rocket that was faster, cheaper, and could be used more than once. NASA's Artemis program didn't have that kind of rocket. Their SLS rocket was a one-time use deal. After every launch, it was like throwing the rocket away right into the ocean. Not very eco-friendly, but guess what? SpaceX, led by Elon Musk, is working on something cool called Starship. It's a rocket that can be used over and over again, like a space Uber. So far, they've spent $5 billion on it, way less than the $23 billion NASA put into the SLS. But Starship needs to prove it can do the job for NASA. Right now, the SLS is on the launch pad, ready to go. It's NASA's only option for getting to the moon. If it works, it's like a gold star for the United States in the tech department. But if it fails, it's like a big step backwards for the whole plan. NASA's got a lot riding on these tests. If things go wrong, it could be a real headache for the whole project. It might even mean the end of part of the plan. So, you see, the moon mission isn't just about exploring. It's also about dealing with some seriously big numbers and some pretty tricky technology. Embarking on a journey to the moon may sound like a dreamy adventure, but let us unravel the hidden hazards of such a quest. Moon trips are perilous endeavors fraught with life-threatening challenges. One haunting chapter in lunar exploration history was the Apollo 1 launch pad tragedy, where a fiery inferno claimed the lives of three brave astronauts. It's a chilling reminder that venturing beyond our Earth's grasp isn't a walk in the park. The Apollo 13 mission encountered a hair-raising incident as an oxygen tank exploded. Miraculously, no lives were lost and the astronauts safely returned to our blue planet. Neil Armstrong, the famed moonwalker, also danced with danger. In a lunar landing training session, his spaceship's engine faltered, and the module exploded. Swift ejection saved him from certain doom. Even during the historic Apollo 11 landing, peril lurked. Armstrong and his crew faced a turbulent descent. A vigilant U.S. Air Force meteorologist, Hank Bradley, wielding advanced technology, averted catastrophe. His sharp eye detected a looming thunderstorm in the spacecraft's path. Quick action diverted disaster, ensuring a safe splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. Beyond human error, lunar voyages grapple with nature's challenges. 
According to Snowden, moon dust, deceptively innocent looking, can wreak havoc on equipment. Then there's the lunar night, a harrowing two-week plunge into darkness. When sunlight graces the moon, scorching heat poses a fresh threat, and asteroids, those celestial wanderers, menace astronauts on their lunar sojourns. So, before you fantasize about a moonlit romantic escapade with your lover, ponder these realities. The moon is no Starbucks haven. It's a cosmic wilderness where danger prowls. Yet, for the fearless explorers amongst us, these risks only fuel the desire to venture into the unknown. Vanessa, would you dare return to the moon, knowing the perilous dance that awaits? The call of exploration beckons, but the hazards are woven into its fabric. The moon remains a mistress of mystery and danger, waiting for humanity's next daring step. Another reason, according to Snowden, is about how things shift when the government and rules change. In a democratic society, there's always a need for regular shifts in leadership. Each new government comes in with its own hopes and beliefs. The leaders of the United States also affect NASA's plans. Every time a new group takes charge, they have their own ideas for what NASA should do. This creates problems for NASA's plans. Each government focuses on certain projects that don't take too long to finish. This makes it hard for NASA's big plans to happen. These big plans need a lot of money and time. They last longer than just one president's time in office. For example, back in 2004, President George W. Bush asked NASA to come up with a plan after the space shuttles. NASA made the Constellation program. It was part of a bigger plan called the Space Exploration Initiative. The plan was to use rockets and a spaceship called Ares and Orion to get astronauts to the moon. NASA spent a lot of money and time on this, $9 billion in five years, but it didn't work out. Later, President Barack Obama stopped this plan. He said it was costing too much and taking too long. He wanted NASA to focus on different things, like going to Mars, so the plan to go to the moon got canceled. Then President Donald Trump came in. He liked the idea of the big rocket, the SLS. He wanted to use it to go to the moon and Mars. He aimed to get astronauts back on the moon by 2024. He even asked for more money for this, but these changes in plans cost a lot. NASA has canceled many projects and lost a huge amount of money. It's been happening for years. Ever since the time of John F. Kennedy, no president has been able to keep the plan to return to the moon. Every time plans get set, a new government takes over and cancels the plans. Even now, with President Joe Biden, things are staying the same. He's sticking to the same plan that Trump set, focusing on going back to the moon. He's even asking for more money to do it. He's not changing the Space Force either. So, the cycle of changing plans and goals continues. After the intense space race between the United States and Russia, which was an extension of their Cold War rivalry, both nations were eager to prove their technological prowess in the realm of space. This rivalry stemmed from the post-World War II nuclear arms race and took shape as a race to showcase supremacy in the space industry. The Soviet Union took the lead by launching the historic Sputnik 1 satellite in October 1957 and later sending Yuri Gagarin into space in 1961. These feats left American officials concerned, spurring them to seek their own significant victories. President John F. Kennedy, in 1962, faced the challenge of landing Americans on the moon. He appealed to Congress at a time when the U.S. lagged behind the Soviet Union in space development. Despite the difficulties, NASA, the U.S. National Aeronautics and Space Administration, secured the necessary resources. By 1966, NASA received a substantial allocation, amounting to about 4.5% of the total federal budget, enabling the ambitious Apollo program. Within just seven years, NASA's spending boost made the moon landing possible. The space race appeared to end as the U.S. successfully beat the Soviet Union to the moon. Snowden believes that this triumph was partly driven by Cold War politics. President Kennedy viewed the Apollo program as a means to assert American superiority. In 1966, NASA initiated the first unmanned Apollo mission and went on to land 12 astronauts on the lunar surface through six manned missions by 1972. These missions yielded invaluable scientific insights through experiments and the collection of rock samples. Flags were planted and nuclear-powered instruments transmitted data back to Earth. Despite the tremendous achievements of the Apollo program, NASA never returned to the moon after 1972. While the end of the space race played a role, other factors contributed to this decision. One such factor is the immense cost associated with lunar missions, which deterred subsequent administrations from committing the necessary resources.
Another reason from Snowden's perspective is that not many people are interested in the space mission. A survey in 2018 found that most Americans would rather spend money on studying the climate than sending people to the moon or Mars. While 72% of the people in the survey wanted the United States to be a leader in space exploration, only 13% thought sending astronauts to the moon should be a top priority. Some African-American communities were especially against the moon project. Ralph Abernathy led a civil rights protest with over 500 African-Americans at the Kennedy Space Center. They carried signs that said things like, for the cost of feeding an astronaut for 12 days, we could feed a starving child for eight. This protest showed that the Apollo space program was causing division among the American people and the government decided to take a break from space adventures. There's also a theory that fewer kids and young people want to become astronauts these days. Research shows that more kids dream of being successful YouTubers than astronauts. Because fewer people are interested in becoming astronauts, the government and policymakers don't see going back to the moon as a top priority. Also, the constant shift in national priorities has caused significant changes in focus. With urgent matters like addressing climate change, tracking asteroids, combating poverty, promoting gender equality, funding peace missions in troubled nations, and eradicating terrorism, other endeavors take a back seat. Consider the example of Obama's administration, which succeeded in defeating Osama bin Laden due to its clear focus, as opposed to an administration more concerned with lunar exploration. A pivotal moment was the 1973 oil crisis, forcing a shift in national priorities. This shift led to reduced resources for NASA's research and scientific undertakings, affecting their ability to embark on new lunar and Mars missions. The budget allocated to NASA dwindled, falling below 1%, and by 2005, it was a mere 0.4%. Consequently, lunar missions became unfeasible. A 2005 NASA report estimated a staggering $104 billion, now equivalent to around $133 billion for a moon return mission. Given pressing concerns, authorities prioritize issues like climate, poverty, and security over adventurous moon exploration. While moon missions offer theoretical benefits, they're now secondary. This explains why NASA hasn't revisited the moon. The unrelenting shift in national priorities towards urgent global challenges and limited resources for space exploration make it impractical. Until pressing matters are addressed, the alluring prospect of lunar exploration remains on hold. One other big reason, according to Snowden, stems from the problems with computer programs and machines. The last time people visited the moon was during Apollo 17, with Eugene Cernan being the last human to set foot there. So why hasn't NASA gone back? Is it because they can't figure out the science or technology? Unfortunately, it seems like the folks who build spaceships and rockets are still figuring things out. This is causing a lot of risk, which doesn't seem like a good idea. For instance, let's look at the SLS, a big rocket. In April 2022, they tried to put fuel in it and then take it out, but something went wrong. They found a broken part and a leak. The person in charge of checking things at NASA, Paul Martin, said Boeing, the company building the SLS didn't plan and do the job well. It's worth noting that the last time NASA tried a completely new rocket for the moon was way back in November 1967. It was called Apollo 4, and it took lots of people from different places a long time to make it work. It's taken even more years for the new space launch system to get ready for takeoff. Despite mountains of proof supporting Apollo 11's historic mission to the moon, there remain doubters who insist it was all a hoax. In 1976, Bill Casing emerged as a vocal advocate of this theory. He penned a tiny pamphlet titled, We Never Went to the Moon, where he contended that America lacked the necessary technology for a lunar journey. His arguments wielded persuasion because he possessed an insider's viewpoint. Remarkably, he had contributed to the U.S. space program and played a role in crafting the potent Saturn V rocket engines. For these skeptics, the logic goes like this. If we couldn't construct a capable spacecraft for such a colossal odyssey, then the celebrated moon landing must have been an elaborate charade. This leaves us pondering, what steps should NASA take to transform the dream of dispatching a fresh team of astronauts to the moon into reality? Moreover, with China's astounding leaps in space technology, could their progress spur NASA to conceive an even more astounding lunar return? 
In the face of naysayers, Apollo 11's legacy stands firm, an emblem of human accomplishment. However, Bill Casing's tale serves as a reminder that skepticism persists, fueled by the ever-evolving landscape of space exploration. The challenge for NASA now lies in silencing these doubts and rekindling the nation's lunar aspirations. China's advancements should serve as both a motivation and a catalyst for NASA's reinvigorated lunar ambitions. The next chapter in lunar exploration awaits, with history watching to see whether the doubters or dreamers will prevail. The Moon, a four, five billion year old giant rock, raises doubts about human visits. It's a risky venture due to international conflicts and less than perfect technology. Memories of past moon missions filled with astronaut hazards loom large. So is it worth the risk? This ancient celestial body, pockmarked with craters and massive rocks, poses landing challenges. In 1969, the U.S. spent a fortune just to find a safe landing spot, showcasing the moon's tricky surface. Environmental concerns also cloud lunar visits. Moon's history is marked by space rocks bombarding its surface. Then there's the enigmatic moon dust, charged by the sun, troubling Apollo missions. To stay longer or build homes, we must tackle this pesky dust. Moon weather is peculiar, with two weeks scorching heat followed by frigid darkness. NASA strives to keep astronauts warm and powered, but readiness remains uncertain. With human safety at stake, why not dispatch robots? Astronaut Buzz Aldrin argues for the human touch. Robots excel at science, but humans offer unique experiences. Buzz and Neil Armstrong's lunar odyssey included an odd smell. Neil likened it to wet ashes, Buzz to post-firework burnt charcoal. Robots can't sense such nuances. Moreover, lunar mysteries abound. Whispers of potential moon-dwelling aliens persist, with rumors of secret astronaut encounters. Yet caution must prevail. We shouldn't provoke interstellar conflicts. In our journey to the moon, let's weigh the risks and rewards wisely, avoiding unintended consequences that could turn the cosmos into a real-life Star Wars saga. One more reason why going to the moon might not be a good idea is that some folks believe there aren't enough good reasons for it. They think that the benefits we might get from going to the moon are just ideas and not facts. Plus, the government doesn't want to spend a lot of taxpayers' money on a project like this because it's risky. Some people think that the real problem isn't going back to the moon, but figuring out what we can gain from it. They say there's more to going to the moon than just showing we can do it. For a long time, there's been a debate about whether going to the moon is even worth it. The main question is, will we learn important things from this exploration? Some space researchers believe the moon is a good place to learn about how the solar system has changed over time. They say the moon is special because it doesn't have air or water, so it doesn't change like Earth. That's what David Kring, a scientist who studies the moon, thought. But in 2003, a terrible thing happened. The space shuttle Columbia crashed and all seven crew members died. This made people ask why we risk going into space when it's so dangerous. President George W. Bush had an idea. He said maybe going to the moon is a safer way to explore space. But is it worth the risk? That's a big question and it's one of the things NASA is still thinking about before going back to the moon. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you are still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more quality content.